Chris Miller, in one of his videos, talked about how companies like Marvel and DC troll for properties, and he is absolutely right, and that is a great video. I, re I urge you to go out and watch Chris Miller's video on trolling for properties because it has a lot of valuable information regarding intellectual properties, but I'm going to go into it a little further because I have a publishing background. I've studied copyright law, trademark law, and I own a publishing business, which is the SJS Direct Imprint, so I, I have a little bit more of an understanding of how these companies, you know, rip off artists and the various ways that they rip off artists. And this is something that, you know, you have to really watch out for when you sign any sort of deal regarding a com company. Now, you have to understand, you know, back in the days of the 1930s and 1940s when the comic book industry first came out, the whole way that artists and writers were compensated usually was through work for hire. And what work for hire means is that you're paid per job and one, and all you get for this compensation is the payment for that job. And in a work for hire situation, it's not a very, you know, good situation long term. Now, a lot of times in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and even the 60s, they worked like this because, you know, jobs for artists were very hard to get. And then and the, the even, to, even in the 80s and the 90s, it was still very hard for someone to get a, one second, get a um, compensation, you know, just get just to get a job. And a lot of guys, they just took that because it was the only job they could get. Um, and work for hire has always been, you know, one of those hot button issues in the comic book industry because basically the person is being paid just they could create a billion dollar property and not get any compensation whatsoever from it i mean you when whenever somebody you know creates something and in a non work for hire situation like um in the literary world with publishing um you know trade paperbacks hard covers and situations like that like your stephanie meyer in twilight or your um uh jk rowling and harry potter those authors often reap a bigger reward and they can get you know anywhere from a couple of thousand dollars to millions of dollars depending on what type of licensing deals they make and what type of um film and television deals they make depend and depending what type of agent they have and on that side you know you on a literary side you can make a really you can make a lot of money um because you don't get all you own the one you own your property and two you own all the rights to the property whereas in the comic book world it's completely different everything you can create something you can create that same billion dollar character but because you're working under work for hire um you're not going to get any compensation because again you're only being paid per project and all the rights to that project are owned by the publisher and the publisher pretty much can own they can go really get technical and talk about like Chris talked about in his video derivative characters like a superboy or a supergirl and they could really even take away your creator credits and it's not all of this regarding intellectual property you know really does not give people incentive to go work for a Marvel or a DC or even introduce new characters into those universes because again this character could blow up and you know become the next batman or the next superman and all that licensing money all those all those royalties all that um you know those property intellectual property rights you lose all of that because you signed to work for hire deal and a lot of creators today as i see it a lot of them are saying you know what i don't want to deal with this work for hire thing and i've written an entire blog about work for hire um because i do a lot of different articles about the comic book industry and Work for Hire is really stalling the growth of the comic book industry. Is really not helping the industry move forward because when most writers today, like myself, when we create concepts, we really want to get compensated for it. We want to get all the comp compensation, not just you know a paycheck, because that worked again in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s when we had starving artists, and you know a comic book job was a good job that paid your bills, it helped you take care of the family and stuff like that, but. These guys are saying today, like myself, are saying, look, if I put all this effort into creating a character like an Isis or an Easteam or a John Haynes, then I want to 
receive the full compensation for that and keeping the rights to my property you know works for me and moreover you know the technology is so evolved that you don't need to go to a trade publisher or a comic book publisher anymore I mean back in the 60s 70s 80s 90s even the early 2000s publishing self-publishing was like twenty thousand dollars thirty thousand dollars it was very cost prohibitive um, back then so creating your own characters and getting them to market was a challenge I mean you had to literally put your life savings into a character like the way Billy Tucci did with she um, back in the 90s he had to do he had he had been working as a janitor he had to put all of, he's put all his own money into that um, but you don't have to do that anymore I mean with print-on-demand technology ebook technology Kindle Unlimited um, there are so many options for a creator these days they no longer need to even deal with a Marvel or DC yeah they've got the marketing but there's a lot of marketing here too I mean I've been using marketing marketing my own characters on social media for the last six going on seven years I've been marketing my own books and publishing my own books for the last six seven, going on seven years yes it's a struggle to go out and market these properties, you know, your ice, the ISIS series, the East Team series, books like The Temptation of John Haynes and All About Nikki. Um, it's a challenge to do that, but I would rather put in that work rather than give it to somebody else who is not going to, one, value my property, and two, you know, not compensate me in the way that I should be compensated. And the way I look at it is, you know, Especially after watching the movie Avengers Age of Ultron and seeing, you know, how the black characters were just put in ancillary role. They weren't even put in the main story. They were just, you know, on the side. They were never treated like main characters. That doesn't give me much of an incentive, you know, to even think about going to work for a Marvel or a DC and give them new characters like an Isis or an Easting or something like that. Because what they would do with those characters is either, one, put them on the shelf, or two, you know... Um, just not use them at all. Put them on the shelf or just use them in ancillary ways and the character would never grow and the character would never get a following. Or in the case of female characters like your Isis and your East Team, you take them to a place like DC, they would probably wind up put in a murdered and put in a refrigerator and I don't want that to happen because I really, I feel that that was one of the worst moments in comic book history. I do not like the idea of female characters being mutilated and murdered and stuff like that. Now, when I think about, you know, black characters and intellectual property, um, you know, the sky's the limit. We could make that into something really big. And it just takes an understanding of the, and being educated in, you know, intellectual property, property rights, you know, because intellectual property, it's not, ten, it's not, it's not physically tangible, but it's one of those intangible assets that has tremendous value. This is something that, you know, people have used to build wealth with, like um, Time Warner has done with Superman and Batman, and Marvel's done with Spider-Man and the Hulk. And this is something that, you know, people really need to start thinking about when they create characters is the value of their intellectual property. I think about it all the time, and this is why I have registered copyrights on many of my books, like Temptation of John Haynes, All About Marilyn. Actually, you do have copyright the minute you fi have a fixed tangible format, and whether that be an ebook, a paperback, um, any format at all, that's, that's a fixed copyright, but it's always good to register it with the U.S. Copyright Office before you um, take it, your intellectual property out into the market, into the corporate marketplace, because people will try to, they, they, they have all types of chicanerous actions that they try to do, just like Chris talked about with the whole Power Girl situation and with other characters. And this is, these are, they use these technicalities so they don't have to compensate you and pay you royalties. And again, this is another reason why I went and did self-publishing because I, I just got tired of trying to, um, one, trying to enter the marketplace and, you know, beg some other publisher to publish a book like Isis or a book like Temptation of John Haynes. I just got tired of trying to, trying to reach out to them because I've been doing this, you know, since 1997 or 1998. I've been sending out queries talking about, you know, Books for Black Men, one, that was the first book I was trying to um, publish. And second, I was trying to do publish African American fantasy fiction. I was trying to reach out to, you know, publishers like Bain Books and other fantasy publishers, and they had no 
real place or no real reason to market, you know, African American fantasy. So I said I'll take I'll go to a print on demand company and I'll do it myself. And it, it turned out to go go very well that way. But I said, you know what? I really there were issues with the last book I did, Cassandra Cook, but this is a different book. With the formatting and the page layouts. So I started to learn how to do it myself and it was a learning curve, but eventually after I did um, the first book, All About Maryland, and it came out very well, um, I went on to do Temptation of John Haynes, and that book came out very nice. I had originally planned on hiring an artist to do the cover, but the cover, you know, it just didn't meet my standards. It came out all messed up, so I had to go and I had to use my own cover, but um, it came out very well. The book got a lot of critical, positive critical reception. A lot of people liked Temptation of John Haynes, and it, it, it sold fairly well, and... The whole thing is that once I learned did that, I was like, I was okay, you know, I can do this myself and I can reap the rewards. I know there's a lot of disadvantages to self-publishing, but the whole thing is that I own the property, I own all the rights, and I can negotiate those rights myself. I can bring in my own entertainment attorney or my own agent, and if I want to deal with um, other intellectual properties, um, I want to deal with somebody who wants to do film or television or, you know, action figures or stuff like that. This is hypothetical, but if I wanted to deal with people on that level, you know, I could do that, and you can do that on your own. And what I've been trying to do, again, with this SJS Direct imprint is say I'm going to make my own stuff because I feel that it's just a waste of time to sit there and send people queries, and you have these great properties and these great concepts. So it's just better for you to just go out there and publish it yourself. Again, the technology is out here. For anybody to publish a book, um, you can go the, with Lulu or Create Space. I right now I've been using Create Space. I used to use Lightning Source to do it, but I but my well, my, my money ran out and I couldn't continue to pay the maintenance fee. So now I'm over at Create Space and they're doing a, they do a very good job um, with my books. I just wrapped it aside. Regardless, they did a spectacular job, you know, on that one. And it, it looked the book is beautiful, um, and there are so many tools out here for a creator to use to make their own prop make their own properties you don't need to wait for you know a Marvel or a DC to come and then ask you oh you can work for them and work for hire and you can get some small change yeah there's gonna be a lot of work involved but you can make more money you know and get more exposure for your own characters if you're willing to put the work in I'm I've been willing to put this work in for six going on seven years, and I'm, I'm, I know I have still have a long way to go, but I'm still persevering, and I'd rather persevere doing my own thing, rather than sit there and wait for somebody to acknowledge me. That's one of the reasons why I got into self-publishing because I got tired of waiting. Um, you got to wait for somebody to approve of your book, when you can just go out there and reach the audience yourself, and that's something that black people, I feel, need to do. Is we have to start reaching out to our own audiences and trying to find, discover our own readers instead of sitting there waiting for somebody to give us a black character created by a non-black person like your Black Panther was. And that that's something that we really need to do is create our own characters, um, create our own properties. Because again, the technology is here. I mean, Amazon has Kindle um, and that's, that's an open platform. I mean, E.L. James made herself a millionaire with Fifty Shades of Grey. Several other authors have made themselves very... One guy made $450,000 just selling books on Amazon. I'm trying to build a platform myself on Amazon and other ebook platforms. I'm also trying to do it with Create Space and, you know, print-on-demand paperbacks. I used to... And I, I feel that it's better for me to create my own content than sit there and, you know, wait for these big companies to make something. And, you know, when you own it, you own it all outright. And then you can also, if it ever comes to that point, you know, make your own licensing deals. And you can learn, you know, from the lessons from guys like Aaron Magruder, like what he learned with the Boondocks. Now, you guys really should look into that because that, that's also another, you know, pitfall with intellectual properties. They can um, have you pushed off your own show and then, you know, go that route. And you have to be very careful with that because... Once this is on television or once this is up on screen, this is the, the version that many people will see as the true version, almost like with Winnie the Pooh, you know, A.A. Milne's character. 
there's a whole different Winnie the Pooh, but the Disney Winnie the Pooh is considered the American icon. And you have to really watch how, what type of deals you sign with people with regarding intellectual property. Yeah, you can get, again, you can get compensated a lot in the front, and but with the back end. And if you're smart, you'll be able to negotiate, you know, a deal where you continue to get royalties and they make sure that your property continues to get exposed. Another thing you have to watch out for is what they do with Static Shock. Um, yeah, it was the number one show on television, but again, no action figures, no DVD, and people were saying, oh, nobody will buy a black figure. And I remember when they were talking about, you know, they wanted to put Static in the DC Universe Classics line, and they said, oh, no, well, black people may not buy that toy. Then they go and bring out, you know, the white character, Commandy, who shelf warm and is still at some Walmarts to this day. Now, Static was the number one character, and it was just sad because he has no, the show was number one in households. It had a big following. Um, Static teamed up with the Justice League. He's teamed up with Batman. He teamed up with Green Lantern. He teamed up with Superman. And all those episodes, you know, if you don't, unless you go to YouTube, you're never going to see them. And I would always, I always wanted to own Static Shock in my collection. And there hasn't been a DVD box set yet. And it's like a big gaping hole in the Bruce Timm and Paul Dini universe and the animated universe. And people want that set. And I want that set. And it's always, always bought, been, you know, disturbing to me that we never got anything out there regarding the static character um, in merchandising and licensing. Um, basically because the way the deals were structured, I mean, and that's also something that, you know, you don't have to deal with any, black people don't have to deal with anymore because now... We have 3D printing, we have, you know, shape waves. There was a guy, he was on a fool. He made his own action figures using 3D printing. It was a, he made action figures, kits that you can assemble. Again, there, there's just so many opportunities for us to make our own stuff that, again, you don't need to wait for, you know, somebody like Time Warner or Disney to, to do it for us. I mean, again, when I saw this guy, he used something like a 3D software and he made his own action figures. Um, you can look it up on the Foosh, it's a message board, a guy called Strange Fate. He made, he made his own action figures. And, again, yeah, there's so much technology and so many tools that can be used that we don't have to, you know, wait for people to do it for us. We can go out and do it for ourselves and make our own properties and, you know, get the compensation ourselves and do things for ourselves. And this is something that black people... You know, in the, in the comic book world and the fantasy world, this is something we have to learn how to do. Because when it comes down to our characters and our properties, you can, all you're going to get is a bunch of rejection and a whole bunch of stuff. And I'd rather just, you know, instead of spending money on query letters and postage and all this other foolishness and trying to talk to agents and trying to make my concepts fit into somebody else's world, I would rather just go to work on my concepts, bring them to the marketplace, and then let the audience decide. And, you know, I feel that's a better use of money and resources than anything else. And this is something I urge other people to do because it's, it's really a very positive thing. It really energizes you and gets you going. And it, it makes you feel more confident about yourself when you can put your own property out there. And that's something I've been doing going for the last six, seven years with this SJS Direct imprint. And, you know... I've, I've, I've gone through steep learning curves regarding it, but I would rather just go out and publish my own stuff. And this is the golden age for self-publishing and, you know, creating your own concepts, creating your own product, creating your own stuff, and just getting it to the marketplace. Because, again, the technology is here. You don't have to wait for a million-dollar licensing deal from a Hasbro or a million dollar or a million dollar um, book deal from Scholastic. You don't have to wait for any of this stuff. I mean, E.L. James is not, didn't wait for Fifty Shades of Grey, um, and other authors have not waited. I'm not waiting. I'm sitting there going, "Look, this marketplace is wide open. This technology is right here. Um, make your own stuff. Try to reach the black audience, or even go beyond the black audience, like I have with the ISIS series. I mean, I've reached." readers in the UK, Italy, Germany, Japan, Canada, all over the world. I mean, the marketplace is wide open, and there's no need to, you know, deal with these big six corporations and beg them 
for some pennies on the table or to do work for hire where you're not going to get anything for all your hard work. I mean, I've been with the character of Isis is about, what is it, about Predator in 1998, 1999. The character is almost, is about 15, 16 years old. And I would rather, you know, put the boots on the ground to get the character to the audience rather than sit there and wait for change from a big a publisher who's going to try to screw me out of my royalties like they do are trying to do with these poor DC creators who spend all their time and effort, you know, trying to build this DC universe and now you have the publisher trying to take away their royalties on reprints and other intellectual properties like when they use these characters in made for video and all this other stuff they don't want to pay these creators for all their hard work because again if it wasn't for them creating the property they wouldn't have anything of value and for me that's that's really reprehensible to do that to a creator especially when these guys have put years of their life into this industry and years of their life into this business to treat them so shabbily is just reprehensible I mean if it wasn't for these guys a lot of these kids would not have you know heroes to promote values and ideas to them and these and the, and the publisher themselves would not be billionaires because if it wasn't for these seagulls and the Schusters the Bob Kanes or even the Sean James is creating stuff there would be no superhero movies for them to make there would be no television shows for them to make there would be nothing for them to make, and this is something people don't understand because um, they don't understand that many of the concepts you see on television were originally books created by authors, and those authors deserve to be compensated. And the same thing with these comic book creators; they deserve to be compensated in the exact same way. You know, your um, J.K. Rowling and your Stephanie Nauer Meyer were compensated for Harry Potter and Twilight. Your comic book creator deserves to be compensated on the same level. I mean. As I see it, profit sharing should be a major part of any, you know, new publishing deal between an author or a creator and a comic book company. It should be a major part of it. I mean, if you create a new character and that character becomes popular, you should be able to get a percentage, a royalty percentage of on the price of on the on the net price of anything made and sold. Um, because you got to understand on, on, on anything sold, anything, you need to be able to get a, a percentage of that net price. That should be a cut of your money because, again, this property has value to the publisher. It has, pro it has value to the company. So it should be, if it's that valuable, you shouldn't feel bad about giving this guy, you know, a couple of pennies on the dollar. Yeah, it's just a couple of pennies on the dollar and it's compared to the billions of dollars that these companies are going to make on toys, um, video games, and all sorts of other intellectual properties, everything from streamers and paper hats and all sorts of other stuff, this is, this is small change for them to give to a creator, give them what usually is 10% off the top. 10% is nothing compared to the 10% of a billion dollars. That, that's like... Uh, really a hundred million dollars that's that's and for creating this character that you're gonna make and you're using three four five maybe even six movies yeah that that, that creator needs to be compensated and then you're gonna also gonna make comics and other stuff yeah this this creator deserves to be compensated because they're bringing revenue and income into this company that it wouldn't have had before this is one of the reasons why I advocate you know for creator compensation this is one of the reasons why I self-publish now is because I believe that you know why should I take uh, ten percent of a royalty off the net off the you know not even the list price because in, in, even in a paperback deal you only get ten percent off the gross price um, and why should I make that type of deal even if I'm gonna sell a hundred thousand copies when I can sell that same hundred thousand copies if possible um, if I can make, sell that same hundred thousand copies and make that money myself because under deals that I've done, you know, with Lightning Source with All About Maryland, I was making anywhere I was making anywhere from um, five to six dollars a book. Whereas if I did that with a trade paperback, people I would have made about a dollar forty on a fourteen dollar on a fourteen dollar thing. And it's just better for you to go and do it yourself. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of hurdles and a lot of obstacles, but over time, as you build an audience, you're gonna make the money. And then you're going to own the rights on top of it, and then you're going to have, you know, 
that intellectual property that, I'm sorry, builds wealth over time. And that's what you have to really think of as a creator is not only about, you know, being creative and making these great concepts, but you also have to have a good sense of business when you enter the um, creative areas. Um, you have to have that business sense. And this is something I read in a self-publishing book many, many years ago, way back in the 90s when I first got into publishing, is that they said you have to wear two hats. You have to wear your creative hat and your creating stories, but then you have to step over and have a business hat on. This is why I'm glad, you know, I have a business degree. It's one of the tools that I've used um, in Golden Ass, JS Direct and Print. And it's something that you really have to really look out for. You just cannot just create characters. You have to have, you know, a business plan when you're marketing those characters, when you're selling those characters, and even when you're trying to reach new audiences of readers. Um, it's something that you have to have with you is have that business acumen so you can know how to tackle the market. And this is something many creators, you know, they don't really think about until this action figure or this character becomes very popular and then it becomes like the whole Superman situation. You're just going back and forth in the court. And people didn't think, you know, about intellectual property then. And they still, a lot of people still don't think about intellectual property and property rights as it relates to comic book characters and fantasy characters. And this is something, you know, you really have to do your research on before, even after you, after you draw the character, you really should, and finish the story, you really have to do your own research on copyrights, trademarks, um, and things like that. This is your intellectual property. Again, this is what companies use to build wealth with. And wealth is a fixed tangible asset that builds value over time. And characters like Superman, your Batmans, all of them built value over time. And this is something that, you know, as a creator, you have to really think about long term. This is something I think about and I thought about even as I was creating properties. I was sitting there going, you know, I have to think about, you know, the value of it and protecting it and preserving it because there's all sorts of deals that people try to get, hook you in like what happened to Aaron Magruder and Sony and how his boon, he, he did the boondocks and then in season four they decided you know we're not going to even have you on the ship have you running your own show we're just going to take your show and the whole thing is that they wanted to um, do whatever they wanted with the characters long term this is what they do they push the creators out and then they because they, they think they understand your story models and your concept, this is what Hollywood does, this is what, you know, the big six do, is that they, they think they understand your concept and your story model, so they'll push you out, and then they'll try to, then they'll just try to take your characters and do whatever they want with them, and then it won't even look like what your original concept even looked like. And this is another thing that you have to look out for when you deal with people regarding intellectual property, because people are always looking for a way to take event to change people's concepts um just like with dc down doing with this new 52 they really don't want they really they want to make money off of you but then they don't want to compensate you for it then they want to take your concept and totally change it but if you are good with copyright law and trademark law you can protect yourself from that again um if you understand the rights involved and what you're selling to people because again if you break these rights down in the right way you know what to sell to people, and you know to avoid things like all rights clauses. This is this is a very deadly clause that a lot of times people want to come to you when your property is starting to get hot. They want to come to you with something talking about all rights, and you sign that over, or you sign over other things. You have to really understand how to um, what rights you're going to sell to people. Like if you're selling television rights, you're selling television rights, and it gets really super technical. Because I, what I found, even with the action figure business, you know. There are certain scales you, you can sell rights to. Like if it's a three and three quarter inch scale, you can sell that to a Hasbro, or you can sell a seven inch scale to a NECA, or you can sell a six inch scale to Mattel, or a five inch scale, you know, to an internet, a Japanese company that's foreign rights. All of this can be negotiated, but you have to understand what rights you're going to negotiate when it's time to negotiate those rights. And this is something that, you know, a lot of people, they don't, black and white, don't look at. Um, and when it comes to intellectual property, you really have to look at those rights. You really have to look at, you know, what you're selling and what they're asking for. Because a lot of times people, what they do is they get so eager to get a deal, they're willing to just hand away everything and you wind up losing long term when it comes to intellectual properties and protecting your rights. Again, 
And the best thing to do is just do it all yourself. I mean, right now, the marketplace, there's so many opportunities. The internet has really opened up the market for creative people. I mean, I, I mean, I was back in the 90s. I remember, you know, putting together the query letters for, you know, the first John Haynes book, The Changing Soul. Never published it, but, and the first ISIS. And I remember just sitting there, you know, sitting there going through the motions, buying these $25 directories, um, spending $50, $60, $100 on stamps and pa paper and postage and sending back and forth to publishers and literary agents. And this is something that people don't have to do anymore now, thanks to print on demand technology and ebooks and, you know, things like Amazon's KDP or Smashwords or the iTunes bookstore. I used to use Google Play, but this, the interface is just a nightmare. I don't use them anymore. But there are so many platforms you can use to get your message, your stories out there and reach those readers that you don't need a trade publisher anymore. I mean, people don't go to Barnes & Noble looking for books. They go to Kindle Unlimited. They go to Smashwords. They go to the they go to these they go to online forums looking for books. I've had people look for Isis the Beauty Myth online. Um, I've had people look for other ISIS series books when I took them from one place to the other. And they're looking here. They're not looking, you know, in other places. They're looking, they're not going to the bookstore looking for books. And even if they do go to the bookstore, they go to the computer, they find out where the book is, and then they buy it there. Or if they have their phone with them, they buy the book and download it digitally. So the, the marketplace is wide open for, you know, an independent publisher to reach those readers. It just takes that publisher being willing to make the effort to reach those readers. And this is something I was very passionate about, you know, regarding African American fantasy, because I really want to see this audience grow. I really want to see more people buying African American fantasy. Um, I really want people to start seeing black characters in the as the primary in the foreground and not in the background. I really want them to see African American characters as the primary focus of the story. And I really want people to understand that, you know, black characters can be just as interesting as non-black characters. And if you write the right story, you can get a reader into those characters and into their adventures. And it's very important for people to see those characters because, again, it reflects, it shows people, you know, that the world is diverse and there's so many different people in the world. And it, you know, the whole thing, especially with comic book and fantasy worlds, is 95% white, 95% male. And we really do need to see stories from other authors and, you know, black authors and other people show that black people are not just background characters. We have our own worlds. We have our own experiences. We have our own stories. And people need to see and hear those stories and come to an understanding of what it is to be a black fantasy fan or a black sci-fi fan and what our world has in it. Now, you can, as long as the safe of this video, you can buy Chris Miller's The Chronicles of P.A., um... I think it's on Amazon. I'm hoping it is. Um, you can also buy it from him directly. Um, you can buy my ISIS series books on Amazon. All of, um, all of them are in paperback on there. Several, like ISIS Wrath of the Cyber Goddess, ISIS All About the Goddess, ISIS Power of the Princess, are on Kindle Unlimited. And the new ISIS Night of the Vampires will be coming out Memorial Day weekend along with East Steam Undercover. Um, right now, you can also get Hold on one second. The African American Fantasy Story, The Temptation of John Haynes. You can get this in paperback. And you can also get it on Kindle Unlimited. Um, this is a great story. It is a cornerstone of the SJS Direct Universe. Um, it's action packed fantasy fiction. It's one of the best books that I believe I've ever written. And I'm urging you to go out and give it a try. Um, and I have a lot of other great books on my. Amazon page, so there's a lot of great African-American fantasy fiction there. There's also a lot of regular f fiction there. And there's also screenplay books there, so there's a, there's a huge, vast array of different titles you can try. Again, many are on Amazon's Kindle Unlimited, so you can borrow them for free if you have Prime. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe.